Good afternoon. This is Dr. John Bennett from sunny Miami. We have another in the series of MedGadget Hangouts, meeting the people behind the tech. Uh, and today we're meeting the team behind the tech of unexpected laparoscopic adventures underground by, by Grendel Gain. Uh, and we have the whole team here, as well as having the person who wrote the article originally. Uh, and we'll just go around and introduce each other uh, to the audience, and then we'll go from there. Hello, William. We'll start with you. Perfect. So, uh, yeah, my name is William Kethman. I just uh, recently joined the MedGadget team. Um, I'm a, a surgical resident over at Stanford University with a background in engineering and a, um, an interest in med tech and innovation. And, um, yeah, it's been a pleasure getting to know the MedGadget team and, of course, the team over at Grendel Games and, uh, and Dr. Hank. Very good, William. Yeah, William was uh, the, the person that wrote the article in MedGadget originally. And uh, we'll start with you, J.J. Sure. Uh, my name is J.J. Savers. I'm with uh, Grendel Games, a uh, serious game development company in the Netherlands. Uh, we specialize in building games that are not only fun, but also do uh, specific uh, training procedures for, uh, for instance, rehabilitation uh, activities. Uh, my background is in engineering as well. Um, and I'm here with, uh, with Hank and Tim. Okay, uh, Dr. Hen, Hen Ten. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is, um, it's a horrible Dutch name, it's a very long name. Hank Ten Kater Hoedemaker, it's a disaster in the New York. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm a general surgeon at laparoscopy since the early, uh, early start of laparoscopy. Um, so I'm an uh, active surgeon, and for 50% of my time, I'm, have, I'm the medical director of our school center, our university medical center. And, um, that's where the whole uh, uh, program uh, started, more or less. Welcome. Yes, and the last member of the team. Hi, my name is uh, Tim, uh, Tim Lanning. I uh, uh, also work at uh, Chronic Games. I'm a JJ partner. Uh, I'm the old uh, creative guy. Uh, glad to be here. Very good, and welcome to you all. Okay, uh, JJ, I guess, uh, do you want to start with showing us the slides and how it generally works? And then we can ask you some questions. Um, uh, I think maybe Hank, you will uh, do a little bit of background presentation. Yeah, on okay, that'll be fine. Whatever project. you want to do. I'll just explain what the, what the project is about. Uh, we have a number of slides. We have a number of, uh, of short videos that okay. show the game that we developed. Okay. We'll take a phone call. Yeah, sure. Um, well, we're, we can do it with slides or without, uh, because the storyline is not that complicated. As I told you, I'm the director of uh, the medical director of our skills center. And we invest quite a fortune in uh, simulators in our skills center. And we were usually disappointed by the use of, uh, of simulators. Let's say the absolute non use of simulators. A worldwide problem. There are lots of simulators around. But we noticed that we do not really like the task oriented like uh, the laparoscopic simulators. Uh, we noticed this, that they dislike them, and they try to get out as soon as possible. What they do, they run back to the department, and they start to create angry birds out of the surgical simulator. So, again, the frustration about uh, the simulators not being used was, was the whole start of the story. Uh, and that gave us the idea, well, why are we not going to make uh, there's only one difference um, uh, improve with a uh, laparoscopic instrument. So let the game be the attractive part, and uh, meantime, by stealth learning, let them use laparoscopic instruments to, to, to let things happen. So instead of a joystick, mouse, or whatever, use a surgical tool. And we will try to, uh, to show one of the pictures. Uh, Okay. Struggling with the with the technique. That's okay. It, 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 it takes a while. You have to know that any technique in surgery is. Yeah. So this is this affect the, the the console. Can you see? Oh, uh, not yet. That's it. Okay. Not yet. Oh, oh, William, can you hear the audio of, of the of their voices well, or, or is it just me? I can hear it. It's just I think that there, it sounds like there's like some sound in one of the. Yep. Rooms and so it keeps jumping between you and them because I think I think Hangouts is trying to figure out who's talking at what right. points. Okay, let me, let me tell my wife to turn the music off. <laughs> that's what that's probably what it is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so then, what you see over here is um, 
more or less the equivalent of a joystick or a mouse, it's the control mechanism. Um, um, we came to the idea uh, in the early start to use the Nintendo uh, Wii, it was not a Wii U at that moment, because it has a very sensitive motion tracking device in the, in the Wii mode. Um, that's a very sturdy thing, uh, uh, very affordable, uh, uh, and it can last uh, for a long time. So this is our control mechanism, and with these devices uh, we can uh, uh, influence the game. And as you can see, there are all the same limitations as in laparoscopy. Normally you will stick in an instrument through the abdominal wall, um, and that means that's the pivot point that's replaced in this, in this instance by a sort of orlock. Um, so that gives the limitation of your movement. So you want to move your instrument, the tip of your instrument, in a certain direction, and you have to move the, the whole uh, uh, gun grip in the opposite direction. So there are a lot of technical uh, stuff in it. So all the limitation of laparoscopic instruments are mimicked in, in this control mechanism. And with this clumsy sort of device, that's the sort of stuff William and I have to work with, um, uh, you have to control the game. So that's, uh, so that's the idea. And there, Tim and Yaya came into the picture. Uh, I came into contact with them. I asked them, well, uh, what do you think about the idea? And could we try to develop a game around uh, uh, laparoscopy? That's where it all started, in fact. Um, so this is the, the trailer of the game that shows a little bit of it. Yeah, uh, okay, I hopefully it comes through. <laughs> have, have a try. Does it work? <laughs> Something happening? No, not really. Um, yeah. Then yeah. now it, it uh, we're getting a okay. Not yet. Mm. Something happening. <laughs> Not yet. I can hear the sound. <laughs> really, I don't well, see the image. That's a nice start. Yeah, that's a start. <laughs> there, there you go. There you go. There we are. Again, this is the entry level. You can um, normally you have to play through all the levels uh, as in every game, um, but later on you can uh, you can choose. Now, now we are in the very first level, and what you can see is a world that has nothing to do with the abdominal cavity. It's a virtual world uh, down under, somewhere in a, in a, in a deep cave. Um, the, the intention of this first level is, is just to, uh, to be aware of the limitation of a 2D screen while you try to manipulate a 3D world. So the only thing you have to do is bounce into a little puppet, it, break it, it breaks it loose from a piece of ice and it starts walking. So the gameplay is that on every level a uh, certain amount of robots, little robots, and it's your task to help them to, to get out of this level. Mm -hmm. And you can do it by breaking it free from the ice. And the other thing is that, what you can see in this level, if you try to promote him to walk a little bit faster, you can send some spark in his back and he jumps up and runs a little bit faster. That looks very aggressive and very sadistic, but again, you're practicing the same skill, hitting something somewhere in a 3D world with on a 2D screen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and there, from there on, uh, the, the game moves further. This is the very first one. And as you can see, the gameplay is, in fact, the motivating factor while you are active. And in the meantime, by self-learning, you are practicing basic laparoscopic skills. Now you're learning to use two different tools, um, uh, or this one, uh, this mm -hmm. one, yeah, don't do that one. Um, and now you are in a, in a much, much further advanced level. Now you are building bridges. No, I'm sure this is not too bad. Uh, now you are build, building bridges, uh, taking care of all sorts of enemies. There's a little bug trying to eat your robots. Uh, in the meantime, you are trying to build to build bridges, getting robots across, uh, fighting slugs, etc. It looks resembles a little bit. Um, uh, you know it, uh, John, from, from, our, from our youth, uh, The Incredible Machine. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a sort of building, a sort of contraption uh, sort of game, where you have, had to build games. In the meantime, you need to develop situational awareness. The enemy is everywhere. Uh, you have to build bridges. You have to fight the enemy, etc., etc. Now, one of your robots is caught by a, a horrible sort of plant. Uh, uh, that's, for you, a challenge to get it free. 
uh, grab the, the tentacle, uh, cut it loose, etc. So in the meantime, you are practicing basic laparoscopic skills, grabbing, cutting, uh, manipulating uh, in, in this strange world. And there's another level, I guess, uh, another one. Uh, no, no, it's, it's not yet. But, but again, as you, as, you, as you can see, it doesn't resemble uh, an abdominal cavity. That looks very strange, but William knows, like, like, like I know, that in basic laparoscopic training, we are practicing by putting matches into a matchbox that has not something to do with the real abdominal world, but again, it's practicing basic skills. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think fundamentally, the, the, what's, what's really interesting about this is and if you look at the literature in, in any kind of training based, is that, I mean, I, I, you'd probably be surprised that most people's first time to ever use a laparoscopic instrument is sometimes in a real patient, right? And, and I think that's the, the, the unfortunate na nature of it and, and that, you know, we have so little time and there's, you know, there's so much to learn in medicine that being able to engage people in actually doing these trainings is such a fundamentally important part of... Because you can buy the most expensive equipment in the world and put it in a simulation lab, and no one will use it. Mm -hmm. Because it's not engaging, it's not something that people want to, to do. It's not like playing, I mean, and this is what I thought, you know, Dr. Hank, one of the things that we talked about is that it's, it's not, you know, it, practicing laparoscopic skills, if it was more like Angry Birds, you'd see all your surgical residents doing it, right? And I think that is the what, what I think interested me more about this than anything is that, you know, it, it provides, while providing you the motivation and the interest, I mean, what was like, I mean, I, I think I spent 45 minutes on the thing practicing, which is 45 minutes more than I think I've ever practiced on a, you know, on any other trainer and didn't even re realize that I was doing that. And it, I mean, we, we have one of these systems now at Stanford and, and it's set up in someone's office and, you know, we go in there and the secretaries are playing on it learning how to use laparoscopic instruments. So, I mean, I think that that's the, the innovation here is in is in is in taking this this game and 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 using it as a tool to I mean this will improve patient care I mean it, it, because people are going to be better laparoscopists and that's like I think that's the fundamentally um, because because they're actually engaged and interested in practice and, and trying to you know to hone their skill and as, I mean that's that's why. You know, whenever we met, I thought that was going to be such an interesting piece of this. What's the actual structure of it? Is it, it's a it's a platform on the internet, right? And, and you have controls in front of your computer too. You have manual controls. Well, uh, it's how, a, how, how do you can you show us? You have it there. Yeah. Well, again, this is this is the gun. Uh, okay. And it's uh, it it has the standard the Wii mode in it the the nunchuck, so it's a peripheral like a gun or whatever you use in, in Nintendo games, you can plug it in very uh, easily uh, and it's ready to use. And again, the other thing you need is with here is the console. It's that, so this is the console. This is just to give you the same limitations as you have in a real laparoscopy. Okay. So that's mounted on that, that yeah. structure? Yeah. You, you introduce your, your instrument in, 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 the, in the OR lock and from there on you have okay. to so you don't have, because normally in open surgery we have all the, all the uh, freedom of, of making movements and yeah. now that's the limitation because of this pivot point. And that's very realistic uh, as in, in that one hmm. and, and I think also the, 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 the interesting thing is your, and this is a skill you learn when you, when you perform laparoscopic surgery, is that you have, there are limitations, right? Like you have certain pivot points, you have to plan plan where you put those pivot points to do particular operations, which this won't, you know, this what doesn't provide you, but what it does provide you is this translation from three-dimensional, you know, moving instruments in three dimensions, but seeing them in two dimensions, and in a lot of regards, not having the same force feedback or that same feedback of feeling the tissue in between your fingers. And so I think that's the, you know, the, the, this spatial awareness of being able to watch and see something in two dimensions um, and practice that, I think, is a really key component of, of being a good laparoscopist. I mean. Yeah, and John, the thing is that we, we try to define what we try to teach. Well, we do try to teach a whole laparoscopic gallbladder removal, 
it's only the basic skills. Uh, I, I explained uh, William. What we try to do, we compare it to riding a bike. Um, William probably that part, otherwise he wouldn't have been falling. Uh, but the thing is, in try, trying to, to, to ride a bike, it starts with the basic techniques. Right? Your balance. And from there on, you're ready to participate in the traffic. So we stay away from the traffic. The only thing we do is teaching the basic skills, keeping your balance and finding the brake, finding the, 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 the bell on your, on your bike. Uh, so that's the only thing. As soon as you master that sort of skills, you have your mind free to, to, to learn that traffic is going to the right, or the left, etc., and has the right of way. So that's the next level. So we don't think we can teach the whole laparoscopic procedure, but only the basic skills. This is kind of a question to uh, the surgeons. Is, uh, is, is, is laparoscopy increasing in use in, in general surgery? Is yeah. it, Absolutely. In, in all areas? Yeah, it's booming. It's really booming. It's one of the source of what we call minimal invasive surgery. Of course, a lot of work done in radiology but, uh, and in flexible endoscopy for gastroenterologists, but in general surgery, William and I do, do a lot of work in, uh, in laparoscopy, removal problems, gastric surgery, bariatric surgery, uh, all, uh, large bowel removals, etc. Yeah, it's definitely. I mean, the trend, Dr. Bennett, is 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 certainly towards less invasive, and um, and that's not stopping. I mean, that's it, it. And I think, and I think it's good for patients. It is good for patients, and I think that's why the that's why the trend is 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 the, the way it is. Um, it just introduces challenges in training that 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 are that are new because I think um, you know you you have a different generation of surgeons, a different generation of um, of of skills that those that that people are brought up with these days that are different, and so there's there's because of that shift and that increase in minimally invasive um, procedures and a shift in and the new kinds of surgeons and then I mean there's just a lot of flex, and I think this is something that it's what's 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 sort of interesting and and to me about you know the simulation based training is 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 definitely gaining in popularity as well, and it's um, these kinds of really innovative tools are what's gonna it's what's gonna allow surgeons to improve their outcomes, improve the care that we deliver to patients, and that's what this is about, right? I mean, it, we you know the, this simulation is is uh, is is nothing without the ability to to have surgeons improve their technical skills and improve outcomes for their patients, and that's what you know that's the goal. Yeah. Well, you know, does this have to go through an approval process, or, or is this kind of like it's not considered? Uh, uh, it doesn't have to be approved, correct? Is it by the FDA or anything like that? It's no, no. 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 Well, in fact, it's, it's the surgical community that's in fact doing the approval. So when you make something that is intended to be a, a simulator, you will have to prove that it works as a simulator. So we have all sort of validation tests to prove that it is an effective training tool. And we, we pass all those validation tests. Uh, and we would be happy if others would like to copy that sort of validation test because that would add to the strength of the device. But it works. Um, uh, one of the things we, we compared it with is doing a standard test um, uh, with real laparoscopic instruments um, that's called um, the pack transfer test, um, where you have to place plastic packs from one side to the, uh, to, to the other one, and we compare that with um, with a, a part of the game, um, and what we could see is that if somebody performed well in the real, in, in using the real tools, he performed very well in using the the tools in in, in the game. It has a four percent correlation mm -hmm. coefficient, so that's that, that's quite high. That means that it very much resembles real laparoscopic instruments. What you can see in this graph. The red dots were people that were supposed to have no laparoscopic skills whatsoever. Those were um, 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 general in, uh, internal medicine residents. So we, uh, William and I, consider them to be extremely uh, clumsy, very clever, but very clumsy. And we co we compare them with the green dots, and those are surgical residents. And as you can see, it's quite a, a nice line, very, very very nicely together. It's only one. 
uh, uh, into a medicine uh, resident that scored very high. We try to explain to them that he made the wrong choice. <laughs> they should have been a surgeon. <laughs> he did the wrong thing. But as you can see, there's a nice separation between the non-experienced and the experienced guys. There's a nice separation to uh, clusters of, uh, of dots. And again, uh, there's a very nice correlation in your score in the, in, the, in the game and in the rule tools. Uh, doc, Doc, did you have a gaming background too? I mean, how did you get into this? The original idea. I have a limited gaming uh, background. <laughs> how did the idea germinate? How did it grow? Who came up with the idea of using a, a, a game to hone your laparoscopic skills? How did that come about? Uh, yeah, that's. Uh, in fact, I was a long time ago working to uh, have a lecture in a symposium about serious gaming. And at that moment, when I was waiting for my turn to present, I came to the idea that uh, I am absolutely at the wrong place. What we do with the surgical simulators, they ask, they ask me because we have a lot of simulators. Right. And they gave me the idea I'm on the wrong place. What we do with our simulators is, uh, is very, very, very serious, but it is a game. And that's, that's the biggest problem with all those simulators. It's extremely boring. Uh, very serious, but no game. Right. So it gave me the idea, why are we not going to make a game to make it more... Have you been at the uh, Da Vinci Center for simulation at all? Yeah. Yep. So yeah. you kind of you compare it, it's kind of boring, the Da Vinci one? Yeah, the Da Vinci is in the same situation. In fact, well, I tried to be... Uh, uh, Quite, quite nice to them. It's a no, it's okay. Uh, they're, not, they're not listening. <laughs> yeah, listen, I know. I got it. But they could be listening eventually. <laughs> and they have a beautiful machine, uh, but again, their simulator is again not very uh, playful. It's a uh, it's a task. It's it's a task you have to fulfill. Uh, so that's again, well, you need another level of motivation, and that's and that's. As everything that William knows, probably it has uh, very much to do with persuasive technologies. Um, how do you reach a certain uh, uh, endpoint? You want people to train, and there are different ways in, uh, in, in, in trying to convince them. The first, the first try, uh, the first uh, time this went completely wrong was was in uh, in paradise. Adam and Eve had a choice between one apple, one juicy apple hanging on the tree. And the promise of an eternal living in paradise. What did they choose? <laughs> they, choose yeah. they choose something that was nearby, very nice, uh, nicely shining, and very attractive looking. So yeah. that's that's the thing. A game is more attractive on the short term, and a promise on the long term is not very well working with most people. So but it seems to, it seems logical to choose a medium to train people that lies uh, very closely to their comfort zone. And we are coming into a generation, new generation of, of surgeons who are training now. These are people who are brought up with video games, so it's part of their it's part of their culture and their upbringing. So why can we not try to use that medium to uh, to for more serious uh, goals uh, apart from entertainment? So it seems like a logical choice to, to choose something that they're familiar with. Well, you know, I think I, I can draw. I don't know if it's an appropriate analogy. I, I grew up with a, a tennis player who was fantastic, a tennis player. Uh, he yep. went to Harvard and, and is a, also a good hockey player. But he used to walk around the house with his tennis racket in his hand. Yep. And, and we thought he was crazy. Uh, and he says, look, I just want to get used to the feel of the racket. Uh, yep. you know, and I don't know if he would have been a champion anyway, but his reasoning was just get so used to the, uh, you know, the racket. That it becomes part of you. Yeah, that's that's true. But on the on the general, that's about five percent at most of most tennis players. Um, so there are certain the, the 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 real top players. Of course, they are so very well motivated. They want to be top of the bill. They want to be the best tennis player in the world. But that's only for a certain uh, two or three percent. But the majority um, is is about 80 percent. And uh, well, they are just just people, just normal people, mm -hmm. and they like to play tennis, but they need some extra motivation. And as you can see, mostly in, uh, in most uh, playing soccer or whatever, if you try to teach soccer skills, the best uh, way you can do it with young children is in a playful sort of environment. 
mm -hmm. uh, play uh, two players against uh, the goalkeeper and a defender. Uh, so it's always um, unpredict un unpredictability is part of the game. So you know what you don't know what the end result is, and that makes it attractive, more attractive than a boring uh, running exercise or something else. Okay. Do you guys plan on? Oh, I don't know if this is proprietary or not. Do you guys plan on applying the same tech to other type of surgical procedures or or well, something and medical stuff? It, it's very applicable, and uh, for uh, for surgical training, underground is the game that we have at the moment. But we do apply the same technology and same philosophy also to other uh, to other fields of uh, of healthcare, like uh, physical rehabilitation. Uh, so we, we feel that the application of serious games is very useful uh, for for a big number of situations. So, mm -hmm. so yes. Yeah, you should you should show the um, JJ. You should show the the demo. I the, you know the, this is um, John. It's a great question. I you know the the. Um, it's it's quite interesting how if you start thinking about this application and you start thinking about other things, you know, stroke rehabilitation and and they have a great demo of a um, of one of their other games that that they've created. Um, I forget if it's for children that are rehabbing or exactly how the but yeah. it's a really interesting application of this too. That I think it, I mean it's just a phenomenal idea of. This again, like this new generation of, I mean, how we take care of patients and being able to take care of them in just totally different ways that we've that we've just ignored for, you know, I mean, because they were they were never obvious. But I, if you could show that demo, John, JJ, that would be, I think, it's a really good illustration of another application. Playing around with the playing around with the technology. So this is a, um, a video of our game called Oath of the Griffin. We actually won a design uh, award uh, with it last week. Uh, two Congratulations. Weeks. Yeah, thank you. We won the national award for best applied game design. Uh, this is a, a game that we've built uh, for rehabilitation of children that have uh, cerebral palsy, uh, um, acquired brain damage. Oh, okay. Oh. So this is a, a child uh, that has brain damage, which is uh, playing the game. Oh, wow. playing the game in such a manner that the physiotherapist can actually increase or decrease the difficulty per child. You can also play it when you are uh, in a wheelchair. So you can customize everything. And we really try to create a video game that looks exactly and behaves exactly like any other video game, so that children that have these uh, problems don't feel uh, that they are special, the, uh, that they can play at home, and while they're playing at home, they can uh, basically train their balance. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a, it's a very, it has become a very beautiful game. We're very proud of it. But uh, the best thing is that we had a very good uh, response from the children that played with it. Oh, yeah. It make it fun for the kid. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 No, I think, it, and John, I mean, that's the you know, one of the interesting, um, you know, what we we were when we were talking about even the laparoscopic game in, in a, these, you know, getting even as a tool to get, chill. I mean, it, getting children interested in being physicians and being surgeons and, you know, um, getting young people engaged in medicine is, I mean, as you know, is challenging. And we we met, we try to mentor high school students and middle school students and. And you know we teach them how to suture and these kinds of things, and I just you know we when we've we, we just briefly talked to some teachers around this this area, and it's the really interesting idea of these tools beyond being serious games that are teaching real surgeons how to be better, you know, laparoscopists. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine how inspiring it would be to have children also get to have those same experiences and. And be motivated to be good doctors, and to be, and to, and to want to be physicians in the first place. I mean, and uh, so the applications of this. I mean, I, the you know what what got what drew me to these guys so much was just the fact that, you know, the this rehabilitation game and and the the this this you know underground, there we're we're just talking about just a totally different way of thinking that, God just has so many applications and how we can you know, again like I mean ultimately we're improving care for patients if we can attract better you know. Better doctors, we can train them better. We can we can take better care of kids, and that's just that's just this is it's just phenomenal. So, hats off. Yeah, you know, I wish I was a kid again. 
uh, back to the start of medical school. I mean, all, all the things that are available to use, you almost have to curate your time really carefully. I mean, there's so much going on. It's, it's truly yeah. really fascinating. Yeah. But, uh, okay, I thank you guys for coming out today. Any more questions, William? No, sir. I, I, I you know, appreciate it. Thanks for having me involved. And, uh, again, uh, team over in the Netherlands, it was, you know, great always to, to, to see you, and we'll stay in touch. We're, like I said, we're trying to work on getting some, some clinical trials um, uh, started. And, uh, yeah, thank you for everything. Thanks for setting this up, Dr. Bennett. Yeah, anytime, William. Um, and, and gentlemen, how, how, do, how does someone get a hold of you? Grendelgames.com, how, how do people get a hold of you? Yeah. Grendelgames.com. Grendelgames.com? Yeah, absolutely. Very good. Thank you guys for coming out. No Thank problem. You for Thank us. you for the invitation. I'll email you the link. Have a good one. Good day. Bye.